We're recording. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this meeting of the Community Preservation Act Committee on November 10th, 2022. I'm calling the meeting to order at 6.02 p.m. Uh, pursuant to the decision of the town of Amherst, which is permitted by the state, we are meeting remotely. Uh, I'm going to call on people now so that we all know that you can hear others and that you can be heard. So when I call on your name, just please acknowledge your presence. Um, <clears throat> David Williams. Yes. Okay. Hello. Hello. Uh, Andy McDougall. Present. Robin Fordham. Present. I was, I see the name beneath you, uh, Matt, which says Sean Mangano on the screen, but uh, Matt Kane. Hi, Sam. It says Matt Kane on my screen. It, no, it does uh, for your name just below you. Uh, Michelle Labby. Present. Uh, Katie uh, Sol. Hi, present. And I'm not, I don't believe that Tim is here as of yet. Uh, I can hear everyone. It looks like everyone can hear me as well. I'd like to welcome one member back to the committee, Robin, uh, who uh, we're glad to hear, uh, have you back from the Historical Commission. And we have two new members, uh, Matt Kane from the Recreation Commission. Uh, after Sarah stepped down, Matt's uh, joined us. Uh, great to have you. And Michelle Labby from the Conservation Commission. Welcome. Um, we're going to have a number of presenters here this evening, uh, and I'm uncertain if there's going to be public comment interest or not. We've allocated a short time period, 15 minutes. Uh, if we run out of time, that is to say, I don't want to delay presenters when their time arrives. Uh, so if for some reason we were to run into any overtime, I would probably uh, truncate the uh, comment and move to presentations and then continue thereafter. So I don't see a lot of folks in the audience, so I think we're doing well from time period. So I'm going to stick with the standard agenda and our first item on the, excuse me, the first thing we need to do is to identify someone to take minutes. Um, and Andy was kind enough to do it at our August meeting. I had done it in the meeting in June, but we do need a member to take minutes. And I'd like to indicate that there, the sessions are recorded and access to those recordings is made available to all members. I use them when I do minutes. And we also have a template for the minutes that can be utilized as a starting point. So with that being said, is there anyone who would be interested to volunteer at this time to take minutes for this meeting. I'm happy to do it, Sam. Uh, wonderful. Uh, thank you, Katie. So uh, Katie will take the minutes. And each meeting, uh, for those who are new, we have to have a member identified to take the minutes. We alternate, essentially. Um, great. So the first order on the agenda is to approve any outstanding minutes. Now we have only one set of minutes that were updated and placed in the agenda, which is the minutes from our August 25th uh, meeting. And I know that a number of uh, individuals communicated minor edits to Andy directly. Um, so I'd like to open up the discussion if anyone has any further edits to the updated minutes that they wish to uh, request. Silence is good. So it uh, looks like the uh, minutes as updated by Andy seem fine. So we'll need a motion to approve the minutes of the 25th. Would anyone like to make a motion? Uh, Matt? I'll motion to approve the minutes. From August 25th. From August 25th. Uh, second? Second. Uh, who was that? 
Katie. Katie, great. Uh, any further discussion? No. So I'm going to proceed to a uh, vote. Uh, in order, I'll start. Uh, I'll vote yes. Um, David? Yes. Andy? Aye. Uh, aye is a formal way of doing it. That probably works better than yes. Uh, Robin? Abstain. Uh, Robin abstains. Matt? <clears throat> yes. Michelle? Oh. Aye, but um, am I, I read the minutes. Am I allowed to vote? You're allowed to vote. OK, aye. Uh, Katie? Aye. And welcome to Tim. I can see you. I don't know if you can hear us or not, Tim. Um, I'm not sure if you're muted or not. You seem to be uh, OK. We're voting okay. on the minutes. Sorry about that. Zoom said I had to update, and it just yeah. took forever. So sorry about that. No problem. We're in process of approving voting on the minutes from August 25th. We've had seven members vote and you're the eighth. Uh, do you wish to vote on approving of the minutes from as updated from August 25th? Yes, uh, okay. I approve them. Okay. So the vote, if I'm not mistaken, is eight to zero. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and see if we can open up to public comment. Although we have a tight time frame, we're looking to start our presentations in about seven or eight minutes here. Um, I see a number of attendees. Uh, if you're in the audience and not a presenter and you have any comment to make, uh, please raise your hand. Sonia, are you able to see hands as they're raised in the attendee list? Yes, I can. There are no hands at the moment. Okay. I'm not seeing any hands raised either. Uh, so I think we're good in that regard. Um, um, so shall I bring in, it looks like Carol Lewis is here for uh, the first presentation. Yeah, in a minute. Um, okay. so, you know, I, I assume they're planning, I assume they're planning on a 615. I want to give them a little bit of a heads up. I see that we're also joined on screen, Holly Drake, and I see David Zomek here. Um, <clears throat> And again, if the mem since we have new members, I'd like for the uh, committee members to uh, say their name and indicate which committee or which method they're associated with. I'm Sam McLeod. I'm the chair. I'm an at-large member. Uh, David? Uh, I'm David W. Williams. I am representing uh, the housing, Amherst Housing Authority. Andy? Yeah, uh, Andy McDougall, I'm um, here for the planning board. Robin? Robin Fordham, I'm here for the Historical Commission. Matt? Uh, I'm Matt Kane. I'm here for the Recreation Commission. And this is my first meeting. Michelle? Michelle Abbey with the Conservation Commission, also my first meeting. Katie? I'm an at-large member. Welcome, Matt and Michelle, and welcome back, Robin. And Tim. Uh, same. I am a uh, at-large. Okay. So we're we're running fine time-wise. Um, we would be glad to welcome the presenters to start in advance if they wish. We have a. 615 times scheduled for the Amherst Affordable Housing Trust funding for affordable housing development when Carol Lewis. Carol, um, can can she hear us, uh, I assume? Um, can we welcome Carol into the meeting to see if she's ready to present? Sure. Uh, hello, I'm Carol. I w I'm one of two Amherst Municipal Housing Trust co-chairs. I actually have the presentation to me, but I would love it if my other co-chair, should she be as a, an attendee, were allowed in the room in case there are questions that she might want to answer. That's Erica Payadeg. Erica Payadeg. Erica Payadeg. 
Okay. <clears throat> Okay. Erica? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I <laughs> never having done this before, but here we go. Good evening. And thanks for the opportunity to present what we have to say. Uh, you've all, I presume, you know, you've all had things to read already and answers to questions. So what I want to say is, I don't think it's a question for any of us in Amherst that Amherst, like so many other places, needs more affordable housing. So the first thing I want to urge you to do as you make the difficult decisions you have before you is to put, to support community housing to the fullest extent you possibly can. The Donahue Institute's 2022 housing study found that Hampshire County currently needs 1500 rental units below $1,000 a month to meet the housing need. It also reports that 54% of Hampshire County renters are housing cost burdened. Home ownership is doing no better. Many who would like to cannot buy homes in Amherst. The school population is falling. And in Massachusetts, the home ownership rate for people of color at 35% is only about half of the rate, 68% for, for white people. And it's home ownership that contribute the most to reducing the wealth gap between Amherst's BIPOC and white residents. To the point of the, of the Housing Trust, as one of the few entities that can hold CPA funds without first identifying a specific project, the Housing Trust is in a unique position in addressing this housing situation. You do your funding work annually, for which we are most grateful. But we meet monthly and could meet more often should we choose to. And so we can meet needs that cannot be anticipated a year in advance. When a project already in progress comes up short, given something like unexpected price increases, we can help fill the gap. Witness East, the East Gables project at 132 Northampton Road. When a pandemic hits, we can set up a program of emergency rental assistance as we did in the COVID pandemic. When a property the town owns has potential as a housing site, but needs pre-development work to de determine the feasibility, we can fund that work as we did in East Street and are doing on Strong Street. Because there are fewer sources that can be used to fund home ownership projects, we can also significantly contribute to the funding of those projects, projects essential, as I said before, to Amherst's efforts to reduce the wealth gap between our white and BIPOC populations. And when a promising property comes up for sale and must be acquired promptly to retain the possibility of affordable housing development, we can help in that acquisition as we did with the Belcher Town Road property. And I have an important sidebar here. Amherst is many things. But one of them that is not often stated is that it is a fixed and finite land area. Much of that land cannot be used for housing at all because it is protected farmland or open space, because it is wetland or protected habitat. So missing an opportunity to acquire land that has an affordable housing potential is not easily remedied. The trust can do the things that I've just mentioned as well as others how we can, however, we can only do it if we have money in our accounts. The funds we have at present, approximately $610,000 that are unencumbered, may be fairly quickly exhausted by projects already in the pipeline. This would render us unable to step in early to add to that pipeline by doing something that needs to be done on a short timeline something unanticipated in time for CA proposal, CPA proposals, something we have not even thought of yet that has the potential for more affordable housing in Amherst. I think the things that have been submitted have spelled out more specifics than this, but this is what I wanted to say to you tonight. And uh, so open to questions. And also if, if my partner, Erica has something to add, please do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 
thank you very much, Carol, for uh, communicating with us uh, and welcome to both you and Erica. Uh, John has been a familiar face to us through the years and uh, uh, we miss his presence, but we welcome your presence. Um, like to open the floor for questions or comments from committee members. <clears throat> um, I heard a comment started from David. I don't know if you- Yes. Uh, uh, go ahead, David. Um, thanks so much, uh, Carl, for sharing the information with us. Uh, a question, uh, I just want to be sure I have this uh, written correctly. You gave, um, made a statement about 85% of uh, homeowners and 68% at the beginning. I don't know whether you were saying uh, the 68% was uh, uh, homeowners of color or what? What were in the very beginning? If I said 85%, I said the wrong number. 35% of home ownership is the people of color, and almost twice that, 68% is white okay. people. If I said 85%, I, th I, I thank well, you very that, much for correcting me. No, that's no, what you I said heard. That now, I'm not going to say <laughs> you said that. All right. All right. Thanks so much. Um. I believe Matt had his hand up next, so I'll call on you, Matt. Okay, so just, yeah, Carol did say it correctly, 35% of uh, BIPOC people are homeowners in Massachusetts. But my question is sort of a sort of a general question as so I'm kind of new to this and just the way I think about things. You say that you have a target of um, 250 new affordable housing units in Amherst, and you also mentioned uh, 1500 in Hampshire County, according to the Donahue Institute. Sort of what sort of time frame do you anticipate having those be built over? Is that kind of a 20 year objective? And sort of the same question really is how many per year on average? Obviously, it's not the same every year, but how many over, say, a five year period would you hope to be um, getting built? Uh, I, I don't really mean to be flipped, but um, kind of not enough. The 250 target started out as 225, I think, and it was part of a five-year strategic plan. That five years has ended, and we have certainly not built that many units. I don't actually have a count. Uh, the proposals that are coming up to you next are going to increase our numbers significantly uh, when they're completed. But it's kind of it's. I can't think of what is a good analogy, but it's when there's an opportunity, the thing is to grab it because you don't know when there's going to be another one. And so production has been spotty. Um, the project at, at the East Gables project at 132 Northampton Road took years to get to the point where they could even break ground. And most projects are like that. It took Valley CDC years to even find a property that they could buy to make it conceivable to do the project they wanted to do there. So there are so many things that have to come together. I don't, I mean, we would like to have done 225 to 250 houses in that five years. We didn't. So maybe the next five right. years has the same, the same goal, but it, it's, it's so spotty, man. I don't, I'm sorry, I'm not having yeah. a very good well, answer. Well, sort of, okay, no, that's actually good. You said a five-year time frame. Um, sort of a related question is, um, so if you requested 500,000, like um, per year, I guess is what you're hoping for. Um, how many how many affordable housing units uh, would that 500,000 you anticipate achieving? Is it like you get, for 500,000, you get, I don't know, how many, 10, 20? Well, for one thing, every dollar that the housing trust puts into a project is heavily leveraged. We are never the only lender. We can't afford, we don't have enough money to be for one thing. And so what we do is to, like I said, pre-development work, funding gap work. And so it depends a lot on what projects are out there 
in the next few years, if the two projects that are about to be discussed here go through, there will be another 70 apartments of which uh, I forget exactly how many will be affordable and they will be 30 home ownership units opportunities of which 20 or so will be affordable. That will be a big increase in a short time. And that's why there's so much funding being asked of you all right now, because there have been a number of opportunities that have materialized in this period of time for which we're incredibly grateful. We need them all. But what will happen next? I don't know. So as much as we can, we work to make sure that every dollar is heavily leveraged. We don't, we're not doing anything where we're the only funder. Always, whatever the town puts in is maybe, I don't, if I say a number, it will be wrong. I don't know, but it's not very much money per unit compared to the overall cost of any unit that gets built. I'm sorry, I feel like I'm being indirect, but I, I just don't have a more, I don't have a better answer, Matt. I'm sorry. Um, I see Andy, you have your hand up. It was before me actually, Tim, if you wanted to jump in first. Oh, excuse me. Oh, Tim, would you like to proceed? Well, thank you. Maybe we have the same question. <laughs> um, my question, Carol, is my recollection when I read the materials that we submitted to us was, that you said, or your organization said, that if there are limited fund, funds available, that we should prioritize giving or awarding or allocating funds to the two projects online before we allocate the, the 500,000 to you. And that's my question. Do you still feel that's true? I think I would stand by the answer in, in, when the questions came after the initial um, the initial submission. What what we said in that case was, um, please fund all of it. I understand you may not be able to fund it fully, but it would. I think it would be a mistake to fund us to not to fund us at all. If you don't fund us at the amount that we have asked that we will not be surprised, but we would hate to see us get nothing because I believe that it might limit some of the possibilities to create a, an ongoing pipeline that we, that we sorely need here. So I, I don't remember actually saying quite what you're describing, but I, but- well, Frankly, I may be ahead. wrong. I, did, I didn't pull it up, but that's my, my recollection. I just wanted to uh, see what your answer to that was, so. Thank you. Uh, Andy. Thanks, Sam. And uh, thanks for the presentation, Carol. Actually, my, my question was, I, I did have one that was kind of similar to yours, Tim, which, which was, um, you know, is there, yeah, like, would, would there be a minimum that you would be willing to take? But um, since you've addressed that, um, I guess there are three projects. For me, right up, it looks like three projects that are that we've we've recent recently purchased the land for. Um, do you think would the money you're asking for be primarily used to supplement those three, or to continue to add properties to the pipeline? And then, just I guess, kind of strategically, is there a backlog uh, that you know you're worried about if we develop? We continue to purchase properties, but haven't haven't developed them. Is that the most effective use of of our resources? If there's a backup, uh, well, we the, I, yeah. So the three properties. I'm just wondering. You know, in the past, it's helped. The property came up. You could just go and buy it right away. Would it be Would it be beneficial if we actually bought a fourth or a fifth or sixth property with this money? Um, or would the would it be more beneficial for us to throw that into the to the full completion of each of these that are in your application? Does that make sense? I believe I understand the question. If I understand, you're saying should we maybe we should use this money to just put it on the projects that are already there? Maybe we should use this money to try to create possibilities for more projects. Which one is more important? Is that a just yeah? A bit? That, that's, that's a better way of putting it than I did. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the answer, I, 
The answer is it depends. It seems to me that trying to make those kinds of decisions in generalities without the specific situations in front of us doesn't work very well. So if we have a choice between a project that's almost built or something, and somehow it really needs something in order to not collapse, that's really important. But so is getting getting other things to be in the pipeline. Part of the thing is I it's it seems to me very, very difficult to make these kinds of determinations globally in advance of the actual situation in front of you that you need to deal with. So I don't have an overall answer. I really think it depends on what the specific possibilities confronting us at any particular time are. I hope that's not a, <laughs> I hope that's an acceptable answer. It seems to me the truth. Um, Sam, I see yeah. Dave Zomek has his hand up. I know if, if, um, I, yeah, I'm not if, sure if you can see that or not. If you're, if you're uh, finished, Andy, with that question. that would. I, I probably am. I wasn't sure if Dave wanted to comment yeah. on uh, on that as well. Uh, Dave uh, Zomak, everyone, I, I see your hands up. Uh, do you have a question so, yeah. or a comment, Dave? Sure, Sam, if it would be appropriate, um, and, and Carol was okay with me jumping in here. Um, yeah, I, I think Carol has kind of outlined the conundrum that we're always in, right? That, that um, you know, we, we want to support projects that are currently on the tarmac and you're going to hear from them. I see them in the uh, attendees list and we're going to hear about two really exciting, important projects, one in North Amherst and one in the East Amherst Village. Um, uh, but I also, you know, so I think, I think you're going, this group, you are going to grapple with, you know, um, a, a number of requests this, this, uh, this session that far exceeds the available amount of funding, right? I think we're in the roughly seven to $8 million range and we have about $1.8 million available. There's always the borrowing piece. I'm sure that Sean and uh, Holly and, and Sonia are gonna guide us through that process. And, and I think staff, my staff is available to come back in. I heard some questions earlier that the committee were, was asking about how many units have been produced and and how many uh, are we looking at in the future and you know I could I'd be happy to have my staff member Nate Malloy uh, work up some of that information but I think Carol has kind of outlined you know this conundrum we're in which is you know do we fund projects that are currently ready and and have other funding have already leveraged other funding um, I think in my mind that is crucial that we we take a look at the projects that Valley CDC and, and Wayfinders are gonna bring before us and really look at those with a critical eye and say, what is a realistic amount of funding that the town can provide for, for them? Whether it's CPA funds that you are, are allocating or looking at or recommending to the town council this round, or whether it's funds that are already, as Carol indicated there, I think the trust has about $600,000 in their, in their coffers. The town also has some funds available for affordable housing, and I think we need to look at those um, all in in in, uh, in in a group, if you will. So, I think there's some decisions to be made. Um, I, I I guess what I would say about future projects is we're also in an unprecedented time, as we all know, with costs rising astronomically. So I think we'll hear that from Wayfinders. We'll hear that from Valley CDC. So. We've got to be realistic about how many units we can we can leverage, how many units we can support, um, and it is going to take years. This is not something that we are going to dig our way out of in three years or five years. This has got to be an ongoing process for the next fifteen to twenty years. So I think we need to look at a long horizon for building units. It does take years. Every community, it takes years to build affordable housing. So anyway, I'll stop there, but staff you, you, is here willing to help you and willing willing to to, to provide you with more data as you need it. Uh, you, and that, that actually, oh, can I just add a quick follow on? I'm sorry, Tim, is that right? Yeah, yeah, we're getting tight on schedule for the next presentation, but if you can be quite quick. Yeah, and it's so just a quick point. You actually hit on one of my concerns, Dave, which with construction costs rising, would it make more sense to invest in the, the construction and development of projects 
um, than to you know have money available to purchase future you know, properties for future development. So, thank you, Andy. I, I'd like to remind the committee members that we we can pose questions to applicants after the presentation. Uh, we'll have time to continue if things come to us. I uh, I saw one other hand up, uh, Matt. If you'd like to place a, a if it's a quick question, uh, we could do so. If not, uh, you know we're ready to move on. Do you still wish to ask your question, Matt? Uh, I, I I can pose the question offline afterwards. Just yeah, just um, send any okay. additional questions to me, and I'll make sure that the presenters get it and get it back to you to uh, everyone. Thank you. I'd like to thank Carol and Erica for uh, presenting, and uh, we know it's uh, these uh, projects and the CPA is important to every all of our applicants. Uh, and so, thank you for taking the time and for being clear in your responses. Uh, we do have a busy agenda today, so I, without further discussion, I'd like to uh, introduce our, or call into the meeting our next presenters, which is the Ball Lane Community Homes. I believe, I see a number of folks in the attendees list. Uh, I have listed on the application, Jessica Allen. Um, and I do see that she is in the attendee list. Yep. Um, you can bring her in. <sighs> I'm a little slow at this, I know. Takes a little time. Good evening, everybody. Uh, hi, uh, Jessica. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, we'll get right to it because we're we've got a packed agenda. Uh, Absolutely. So, uh, we've read your proposal and saw the questions, and uh, uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen and just do a very quick PowerPoint presentation just to try to answer some of those last questions that you posed as a group. So let me just share my screen. Can everybody see that? Perfect. Um, okay, so I don't want to spend too much time on the design because I feel like you've got a good sense, but it is a, a home ownership affordable um, affordable home ownership project looking to build 30 homes um, in 15 structures. So looking at duplex design, a combination of two and three bedrooms, um, looking to try to cluster the development in previously developed areas and protecting as much open space as possible. Uh, building designs will be highly efficient, small footprints, passive solar design, and looking to have uh, PV panels on all of the buildings to help bring down some of those operational costs for the homeowners. So first and foremost, the program goal um, is to build affordable first-time homebuyer opportunities for moderate income households. That is the primary goal of this project. But secondly, there is another set of goals. Um, and a lot of this is um, driven by our, our primary subsidy provider, which will be uh, the Commonwealth Builder Program, which is out of mass housing. Um, and as Carol noted in her presentation, there is a large home ownership gap between black hole Black households and white households in the state. Um, uh, the home ownership rates uh, for people of color is about half of what it is for white households. And how this translate is um, is in terms of assets. So as a direct a direct result of um, the home ownership gap, the median value of assets um, for every one dollar of a white household um, comparable is one cent to a black household and eight cents to a Latin household. So home ownership plays a major, major role um, in the equity gap that we see as a country. And there is a, a national um, goal to try to raise the percentage of Black households to 60% of um, over the next 20 years. Right now, nationally, it's at 43%. So in order to hit that percentage, there's going to be tens of thousands of new homes that need to be built across the country in order to try to, to reach this goal. So just a review of the funding sources for this um, proposed project. As I noted earlier, the biggest um, public subsidy provider is the Commonwealth Builder Program. They are the only program in the state that provides subsidies for homeownership, affordable homeownership um, developments. All of the other funding sources that are through DHCD and, and other entities are for rental. 
Um, so this is the only home ownership program. It's only been around for a couple of years. It's a fairly new program. There's a couple of developments that are under construction in the eastern part of the state, but this would be the first in the western part of the state. Um, the other two big percentages of funding sources are going to be coming from the sales of the homes, the restricted homes and the market homes. And you'll see as a total percentage of the request, the, um, what we're requesting from CPA is, is no more than 5% of the total construction budget, kind of hitting on those same comments you were mentioning earlier with the presentation from the trust. Uh, in terms of the uses of the funds, three quarters of it is gonna be going to construction costs. So that includes the buildings, that includes site design, the um, PV panels, um, and, and so that's where the majority of the funding is needed for this project. And again, as you noted, high construction costs. We've vetted a bunch of numbers with local builders. So we feel like our, our estimates are, are pretty on point, um, but this is where we're landing in terms of the, the uses. There was a question from one of the committee members in the questions that were sent to me about how did we get to that $75,000 number for CPA. So I just kind of want to walk through these. I know it's a lot of numbers, but I kind of want to walk through this chart a little bit. So this is breaking down the cost for the restricted units only. So it's, it's um, two thirds of the cost. So the acquisition, we paid $850,000 for the property in August. Uh, 561 represents two thirds of the cost of the acquisition. So that's the same general formula that's been um, applied. Same for hard costs, soft costs. It's a little bit more than two thirds because there are some soft costs, legal accounting that are very specific to the affordable um, homes that are not applicable to the market. So that's a little bit higher than the two thirds, but generally fairly split. Um, and then two thirds of the developer overhead and fee. Uh, if we take all of that, we're looking at about $10.6 million just for the 20 restricted units. Um, if we subtract out the sales of the restricted units based on our estimates of what we think we can sell these homes for based on the income restrictions, we still have a gap of about $6.5 million. Add in the $5 million that we're able to uh, request through the Commonwealth Builder, um, Commonwealth Builder will provide up to $250,000 per affordable unit um, as a subsidy. So that's where that $5 million number comes from. Still gives us a gap of about 1.5. As I noted earlier, there's no other sources for us to, to, to go to um, at the state level to add, um, to add a, a additional subsidies. And with the construction costs as high as they are, um, we need to fill this $1.5 million gap. So we put in a request for 750 because we think that, um, Dividing it out by the 20 units at a request of about of $37,500 per unit um, is comparable to what's been provided in the past. It's less than what's been provided for other home ownership programs and projects that have occurred in, in Amherst. Um, so we thought it was a reasonable number if you divide it out by a per unit to ask for the 750. We're hoping that Amherst. Um, We'll start thinking about and figuring out a way to release uh, ARPA money. So that will be another chunk that we will be looking at. There is ARPA money at the state. So we're exploring that as well. Um, and then we have also in here um, $250,000 that we intend to request from the trust um, once we figure out where we land with CPA. So that's how we got, we got to the $750,000 number under the CPA. Um, as for sales pricing, um, I just, again, want to, there was a question how we got to those numbers. Um, so the pricing varies. It's going to depend on the size of the home, on the number of bedrooms, um, and the income level in the, uh, of the household. So the range is about $150,000 to $250,000 um, for the restricted homes. And really our goal is to make sure that that a uh, home um, homeowner is not going to be cost burdened. So we don't want them to pay more than 30% of their monthly income on housing. So when we're doing our calculations, um, and I can get into the weeds of this during the Q&A if we need to, but just to give you a sense, you know, we're setting a price of $200,000. Um, a homeowner would be required to put a 3% down payment um, under the Commonwealth Builders Program. They'll likely need to go to either family members or go to a down payment assistance program to, to fill a little bit of that gap, bring the mortgage uh, amount down. This is very variable depending on what the mortgage amounts are going to be in a couple of years when we get this project built. So when we modeled this, it was 
it's now at 7%. So as mortgage rates, mortgage rates are changing, it's making it a little bit more difficult for a homeowner to be able to, to reach this number. But we are calculating because at the end of the day, our bottom line is we don't want this number to get over 30% when we're doing our calculations. Uh, marketing and sales. So for the restricted homes, we are required to do an affordable fair housing marketing plan that would be um, overseen, reviewed, and approved by Mass Housing because they are the, the major subsidy provider under the Commonwealth Builder. Um, they have already engaged CHAPA as their monitoring agent. The monitoring agent will not only just assist on the initial sales of the homes, but they will oversee all of the resales moving forward. So they are in it for the long haul. They're, they're there for the long game. Um, as I've noted, there's a lottery process that will occur um, that will have certain preferences based on Commonwealth Builder requirements and their preferences. Um, just also wanted to note that in the sample deed writers that I've received from Mass Housing, um, there is a, a preference in there for the number of household members to equal the number of bedrooms plus one. So really this is to, to um, prevent a situation where there's somebody's being overhoused, where you've got like a, a single household buying a three bedroom house. Now, of course that could happen with the market rates. We would have no control over that. But in terms of the restricted houses, um, really trying to make sure that the number of bedrooms that we're not, the, that the um, sales aren't going to somebody who's gonna have all this extra room that's not gonna be used. Um, and the, the provisions for the resales, which I've detailed quite, um, put a lot of detail into the response of your questions, are going to be held in two different deed riders that would be associated with each of the homes. So our timeline, uh, we've purchased the property, we're in site design, um, we were next uh, going to be looking at permitting, all the funding requests, if everything goes according to plan and all of the funding, falls into place, we'd be closing our financing in 2024, starting contra construction. And then we're looking to do a phased approach for construction at this point. Um, and we would have all of the sales, home sales to qualified buyers done by 2026. So that is it. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that the committee has. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jessica. Mm -hmm. uh, just uh, committee members, we're tight on time here. so if you have questions uh, that you want to ask at this time, please, please try to be direct and uh, uh, as brief as possible. Uh, Tim? Um, I can't remember. Were those PowerPoint slides sent to us in your written response? No, but I'm, okay. I'm certainly happy to do so. That mm -hmm. would be great. Yes. And just remind me, because I was taking notes too, what was the amount that you had in your slide for the request you're making of the Affordable Housing Trust? $250,000. 250. Okay. And I'll see that when you send the slides. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, if, you. if you could just send those to me, I will put them in the packet for tonight and send them to everybody. Absolutely. Right. Yep. I'll I do it right after we're done here. Yep. I see a hand up, Michelle. Hi. Um, I think it's a, a lovely plan. I'd love to live at that area. But my question um, is about the resource areas on the site. So um, there are some significant hydrological connections to wetlands south of the site and that run through the southern part of the site. And the Mill River is adjacent somewhat about um, 800 feet south of the site, but there are hydrological connections to some open space wetlands and then the river. Um, you've already stated that you have no intention or are not anticipated to build within the resource areas. So I'm just, um, I guess, looking for some further intentions about that, uh, given the cost gap that you just described and that your intention is to build 30 to 32 units, but your max can be 35. If you have to fill that cost gap to go to 35, where are those houses gonna go? And like, is there a possibility that you're gonna further encroach on that Southern riparian edge and into the wetlands? Um, some implications of that will be increased cost of mitigation for that and permitting in that wetland area, especially mm -hmm. like resource buffers. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think if we were to add any more units uh, right now, the, the site slopes, um, the high point is kind of in the in the kind of sword that back end and then everything kind of slopes down towards um, the corner of Pulpit Hill and Route 63. So we need to make sure that the water is going that way. So I think if we were to add additional houses, 
um, which is not our intent at this point. That's not what we've been schematically designing, but it would be it would actually be more encroached towards the frontage than it would be towards that riparian area. Um, we do not intend to um, to develop in that riparian area. And in fact, there's a wetland along Pulpit Hill Road that is a country ditch that is jurisdictional wetland. So we're also trying to figure out our access to avoid impacting that as well. So we are we've we've delineated everything. We have an existing conditions plan. We know where everything's located. It's been provided to our design team. So we're trying to we're designing around them. That is not our intent to design in the wetlands. Oh, Matt. Yeah. So um, I'm assuming that 250,000 per unit from the state is based on building just a standard code. I'm wondering how much of the funding gap is is caused by or resulting from um, building these to like net zero or close to net zero. Yeah, so I, I think that the construction costs, um, I mean, it, the, the heating and cooling, it's it's. I don't think it's going to be anything uh, crazy. It's not like we're going to do geothermal like we're looking at some of our other projects. It's fairly standard high efficiency uh, heating and cooling systems. Um, if anything would get value engineered out, it might be the PV systems um, that we're carrying right now at um, around $360,000 total for the project. Um, so what I think if we ended up having to do cut those costs, we would probably wire the houses for them, but maybe we wouldn't have the opportunity to do the, the panels themselves. But honestly, okay. I think there's enough. So you think the, the yeah. funding gap is just driven by construction being more expensive than the state budgeted for? Yeah. And I, you know, the other piece too, to think about is, um, and I think I put this in the response is, um, you know, at East Gables, uh, we have one building, one basement, four main walls. Yes, we have interior yes. walls, but so this is, you know, you've got 15 different structures. So just having 15 different basement slabs and 15 different construction, 15 different mechanical systems is going to be a higher cost than if it was just one building with a bunch of units in it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I have uh, one last question for you. Um, it was asked uh, if there, a preference can be provided for eligible families that have lived in Amherst uh, for a certain amount of time or in the area. And in the response, it indicated that um, the, town, the, the Zoning Board of Appeals can inquire and if the town, if the municipality can prove to the state there's such a need, uh, they can require up to 70. Can you quickly explain how that works? Because sure. uh, the assumption from my end is that, you know, there certainly are families in need in Amherst mm -hmm. uh, who might meet the criteria. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's, we intend to permit under the chapter 40B permitting, a comprehensive permit. And under the comprehensive permit guidelines that are put out by DHCD, there is a section on local preference. And they're very specific about how that local preference works. Um, I've confirmed with Mass Housing that they follow the same guidelines. Um, so what it is, is during the permitting process, the Zoning Board of Appeals would make a request for a local preference at a certain percentage. It cannot be more than 70%. It certainly could be less than 70%. So I guess that's kind of what I'm challenging Amherst to think about is, you know, in a community that's majority white with a program goal that's trying to increase black home ownership, you know, what is that percentage? I think it, you know, I think if you wanted to put a percentage there, that makes sense, but what is that number? And I think the town has to do a little bit of digging and maybe a little bit of research to determine what that number would be. Um, but under the permitting, a condition of the permit would be local preference. And so when we go through our construction financing process, that's when the town would need to submit to mass housing its reasoning on why they believe local preference is needed and to have data that backs that up. And then mass housing would review that and approve it. And then, then when we move forward with the lottery process, that would be part of the lottery process. It would be very specific within the, um, the um, preferences. So we would have certain preferences listed um, local preference would be one of those preferences, but we would also need to make sure that they're eligible under the Commonwealth Builders Program under the requirements. And we'd like to see a preference for um, for those that meet the disproportionately impacted household under the ARPA definition. So, so, so it would be just another preference within that lottery process. If I understand correctly, you're indicating that the municipality needs to bring this up at a later point in the process, although we're being asked for funds at this time. Um, have you had other examples where committees 
might have interest in uh, gaining further uh, clarity on that? And, or is it kind of a, just a timing issue where one has to depend on the uh, zoning board as opposed to the CPA committee? For sure, I mean, I think it's a, a timing issue, but I, I think if the CPA committee feels strongly about that, I would say during the permitting process, you would want to put some letter into the ZBA boards and let them know that this is a preference of the CPA committee as well. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. You've been very quick and thorough, and um, I'm sorry that it's a, a bit of a, a compressed time period for you. No problem. Um, uh, committee members, we can ask questions again that we may not have had the opportunity to come to us later. Uh, so I'm going to uh, say thank you, and uh, okay. we're going to move on to the uh, next presentation. If we have other questions, we'll certainly be in contact with you. Okay, so you'll email the questions I don't need to stay on until the end of the meeting. I just want right. to make sure. Okay. Uh, you're welcome to stay on. Uh, okay. But we're not, to... it, it wouldn't be part of the plan for okay. us. Okay. I didn't uh, want to vacate and then have a question and have me not be here. So, yeah, <laughs> no problem. So, okay. Very good. Thank you, Sonia. I'll send you the presentation now. Great. Thank you. So, uh, Sonia, if you can uh, bring in the uh, wayfinders. Folks, uh, I've got the name of uh, Diane Smith here. Now we're running mm -hmm. a few minutes late here, but uh, we're going to just carry that time forward, of course. I see Diane in here. Can you hear us, Diane? I can hear you. If okay. you could also invite in Michelle McAdair um, and Faith Williams if you uh, you can find them for, for purposes of presentation and questions. Oh, I think um, we have we we have a PowerPoint. We're trying to figure out who's who's driving the PowerPoint. <laughs> I, want, I want to start. I understand that we're running late. Just want to thank you all for um, asking. Well, us we're not going to cut your time short. You're going to get your full allotted time, even though it's a compressed time period. Is James Gruber in the, Sonia, is James Gruber from Wayfinders in the? Yes, I am, Michelle. I'm ah, here. here. Okay. Hello. Okay. We were, we were wondering. Because okay. <laughs> we couldn't see who was in there. The floor is yours, Diane. Um, but thank you so much. Thank you for inviting us um, this evening. We're very excited about the property that uh, we're going to be talking about. Um, just to kind of, you know, for those who aren't familiar, um, Wayfinders is a comprehensive housing agency that serves the Hamden, Hampshire, and Franklin counties across a spectrum of housing, um, from sheltering the homeless and uh, to the development of affordable and market rate home ownership. As you can see, our, our mission is to build and advocate for a thriving and equitable region by improving the stability and economic mobility of families and individuals, together with developing and managing a wide range of housing to support strong communities. Um, so we have uh, responded to the RFP that was issued by Amherst, and I'm going to have Jamie Groomer talk about the, the properties that, uh, the project that we're, we have proposed and the, the requests that we're making. Jamie? Thank you, Diane. Hello, my name is uh, Jamie Gruber. I'm an associate project manager here at Wayfinders, and I'm going to give a brief overview of the development and speak about the proposed buildings. Um, in 2021, the town of Amherst issued an RFP for the redevelopment of the town-owned properties, including the former East Street School and land on Belcher Town Road. Wayfinders was selected by the town in 2022 to develop both properties into affordable housing. By effectively using the sites, it creates a rare opportunity to add approximately 70 homes units to the current housing stock. There will be workforce and market rate units in addition to 40 low income units. Both sites will have elevator access to all units, community spaces, and amenities, creating visitable and barrier free housing for the residents. The sustainable development will seek passive house certification, enterprise green community certification while incorporating solar energy into the design. After construction is complete, Wayfinders will also manage the properties with on-site offices and community groups that allows for a meaningful presence of management and supportive services. We are currently in the early stages of the design process, so some items may change slightly as it progresses. 
The E Street School, as you can see here, will be redeveloped into approximately 29 units, reusing the existing school building along with new construction. The architect's design is intended to provide the feeling of a New England inn and has been limited to three stories to fit within the existing neighborhood. There is a welcoming central courtyard and lobby entrance with access to the elevator, community room, management offices, and all of the units. Currently two units at the East Street School site will be fully accessible and will also have one sensory unit. The other property located on Belchertown Road, approximately 1,500 feet to the south of the East Street School site, will be a 41 unit building inspired by rural New England architecture. As part of the design process, the town of Amherst encouraged us to bring the buildings closer to the street to provide a village feel with a parking area tucked behind the building. We are planning three units at the Belchertown Road site to be fully accessible with one additional sensory unit. I'll now pass it back to Diane to um, discuss the benefits of the CPA funds. So thank you, Jamie. Um, so we've made a request for $1.8 million of CPA support, funding support um, to this project, which total development cost is $30,610,000. So the overall ask would be approximately 6% of the, the entire um, commitment. The reason that this is so important is that when we're looking for state funding, they want a demonstration of uh, local support for affordable housing, which makes this particular uh, development proposal more competitive when we're looking for, when we're competing for other funding and tax credits. You know, clearly this would increase the stock of affordable housing, um, as was mentioned earlier by, by the trust, as well as uh, by Valley CDC. It's really important for us to be able to be part of that, that increase of affordable housing that is so desperately needed in the area. The money that we're, we're proposing, uh, the use of the, the $1.8 million, $1 um, would help us on the, some of the early stage work uh, for planning and due diligence, but it would stay in the project throughout so that we, it's not uh, similar to a pre-development loan where that would be repaid. This would stay in the project and uh, help to, to fill any other gaps that are that are available or that show up in the in the property. The the way that the the state runs the their um, their application cycles, is that when you have uh, properties that also have a local support that expedites the funding process. So it makes it more competitive, but it also makes it more um, that there's, there's more opportunity for uh, additional awards uh, in the future. So we, if, we're, if we go through a process of the first time, we have another sort of bite at the apple when there's local support. And we have had uh, a quite, quite a bit of success in Amherst. Uh, as you know, we've got Butternut Farm and Olympia Oaks already um, in Amherst. They have been very successful projects. We've been very pleased with our partnership with Amherst. Uh, it has been very, very successful and our, our residents and tenants are very happy where they are. We'd like to continue with that relationship. So that's the, that's the, um, the reason for the request and how we would use those funds uh, should you decide to move forward with our request. We'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Diane, for, mm -hmm. for the presentation. And I'd like to open the floor to committee members to um, ask any follow-up questions. Uh, Matt, I see that you have your hand up. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Diane. And um, my question is why so Amherst is providing the, the land for both the Belchertown Road and the East Street School site. Why is that not considered a local contribution? It is, but they also want to see a financial contribution. Okay. Couldn't we just, um, uh, so you, you purchase those properties and we donate the money back? We've already signed Good. the development agreement <laughs> well okay but i mean the value the value of those is significant the value of those like 
the, we paid already 700,000 for Belchertown Road and the East Street property is currently assessed at $2 million. It will the we can we can make an effort to propose that um, I would say with uh, our experience with DHCD is that that cash investment has has meaning um, in the in the competitive process. I agree. I see. Okay. Uh, uh, do you have a follow up, Matt? Um. If if it's if the development agreement had been structured differently, as I would it have made a difference? Had it been structured where we where we purchased the property, or that that the town provided us the funds to purchase the property, is that the question? Yes. Yes. I suppose if it were if it were considered a, a cash investment, I suppose it could have been. Yes, it would have been. Okay, even if even if the town is the owner. Well, the town wouldn't be the owner at that point. So we're doing a a nine. No, I mean if the if the town provided you two million dollars to purchase the East Street School from the town. But there's laws and rules about disposing of public property. Well, well the, the, the agreement's already been completed. Is that correct? OK. Yeah, uh, it might be water under the bridge. Uh, Andy. I see your hand, Sean. Uh, Andy uh, McDougal. Sam, yeah. my, my response is specifically in response to Matt's. Is that, can I just give a uh, Yeah, uh, is that okay, Andy? If uh, Sean course. jumps in. Uh, John uh, Mangano, Town Finance Director. Uh, thank and you, Matt, Sean. you may be aware of this, um, and, and Dave, I don't know where you are um, if you're still on the call, but um, so we did a request for proposals when we sold the properties. So we advertised it and we received multiple proposals. Uh, proposals and there was a review committee that um, evaluated all those proposals and I think at that time they knew that it was uh, it was part of the proposal that there might be additional funds needed um, down the road so it's not a it's not a surprise necessarily to the town um, but if I'm, I'm, around, I'm not saying I'm not saying that I'm just saying we already made a contribution why doesn't the state consider that a right no I, contribution? I agree with you I, I feel like that should be part of the value totally yep Thank you, Sean, uh, for providing that uh, added information. Uh, Andy? Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, and thanks for the presentation. Um, my question, um, you know, 1.8 million, which is close to the total funds we have, if we couldn't, if we couldn't provide all of that, um, is there a way that you would want to split this maybe between the properties? And if so, how might you prioritize that um, so we could perhaps think of a smaller number if need be? Michelle, and you've been managing the budget. Yeah, I know. And, and so we're developing it as one project. So when we come into the Zoning Board of Appeals for the 40B comp permit, it's going to come in as one development, even though it's two sites. So the Department of Housing is going to want to see this as one budget. So a smaller amount would just mean less for the overall project. Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, Tim. Yes, uh, I was looking at your sources of funding and I did not see any uh, request of the Municipal Housing Trust. Uh, or, am I misreading that or is the, are you not requesting any funds from them? We we're not thinking of it but if it's if it's a source and if we don't get the full amount from the cpa we are going to have to find money to fill the gap um on my sources and uses we have exceeded guidelines from the department of housing so on a lot of these we've already exceeded the limits and you know, DHCD could say, you got to bring it down to 
our guidelines, and then we'd even have a bigger gap. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And is this a new question or did you? Yes, I have a sec. I have a separate question. Um, and sort of a follow up directly to what was just said. Um, how much of the uh, the cost is driven by uh, specifying this to passive house standard versus something like net zero or near, near net zero? The passive house, I would say, is close to you know passive house the solar it's in excess of 1.5 million okay so that is significant it is significant would you consider changing that to bring the cost of the project down we may have to it's just the reality Right. To keep everything, you know, especially the solar. You know, the, the solar. Yeah. Or you could just, right. I I have a quick question, and I see that Dave Zomack has his hands up as well, and I certainly want to get to Dave. Uh, Dave, is yours uh, uh, an extended uh, discussion, or is it a quick comment? A quick comment. Why don't you ask, okay. Chair Sam, why don't you go first and I'll follow okay. you. Thanks. Uh, my question for uh, whichever of you wish to answer, it may be Michelle, it may be uh, Diane. Um, the town is donating or has an arrangement with a land uh, for the project, and I saw that it's a 99-year lease. Uh, I'm uncertain what transpires in year 100 under the current proposal. Uh, and it may be that you don't know as well, but I guess I could ask the question this way. Under the current proposal, does Wayfinders own the land in year 100? The, the ground lease and the land development agreement is actually silent. Okay. Um, so, so in which case, if it's a lease, that land would remain with Amherst, although the building is being constructed with the costs all associated by uh, wayfinders. So is it reasonable to assume that in that long distant future that there'd be a need for some form of renegotiation regarding lease? There either that or an extent another 99 year. I, I bring this up having occasionally been intrigued at the Panama Canal having a 99-year lease, which did come up, and Hong Kong as well, having right. a 99-year time frame. And those, in the long term, there could be interest for Amherst residents. Uh, thank you for answering. Uh, David? You're on mute, Dave. <laughs> um, sure. I just wanted to add a, a, a few things around the edges. So, you know, I, I, I think Matt's line of questioning is interesting. I, I think we all wayfinders as well as the town share a bit of, I don't know, frustration may be too, too strong a word, but how the state values local contribution um, does create some, some, um, some challenges for us. Uh, I think if you look at, and, and we are partners on this project. I mean, really it was it was the town of Amherst working with the trust that went out proactively, purchased the land on Belchertown Road with the express purpose of pairing that with the land that we already owned and have owned for decades, the East Street School. Um, I think, Matt, I might not have heard you correctly, but I think you, were you looking at the assessor's records for East, uh, for these, uh, E Street School, did you reference $2 million? I, I, I Correct. Know. I, I think that is probably uh, not correct. I can't imagine that being on the fair market value really uh, of $2 million. However, I think if you combine the E Street value and the Belchtown Road value, it certainly is a million plus. We, you know, in-house, we probably consider it about half a million or so for East Street, and then we paid about seven thirty, I believe, for Belchertown Road. Correct. So call it, you know, round it out in this in this uh, market to one point five, one point six. So there is some frustration on our part that the state doesn't consider that 
it's not considered a cash value contri contribution to the Wayfinders project. So setting that all aside, you know, we are partners with, with, uh, with Wayfinders on this. We think it's a really good project. Um, again, I think there's, you all are faced with this, this task, this Herculean task of, of deciding how much can be allocated per project. I, I do say that, you know, as much as we, we understand what Wayfinders and Valley on the other project are facing, $1.8 million, and Sonia or Sean could correct me on this, but I think that that's the largest ask that the CPA has, has ever been presented with. I, I don't think we have ever allocated- Until, until next until week. Until week's week, yeah. Right, but we've never allocated $1.8 million to any project, uh, whether it be affordable housing or, or other. So it's, it is a large ask, but it is 70 units. And it's a project that uh, you know we think has has great merit. So I think this is what you're going to be wrestling with over the weeks and months to come. And again, I think you know my staff and I could come back, you know, in a future meeting and and try to try to work with Sean and and Sonia on some of these numbers and and perhaps get us to to a a, a point. Where we can make or you can make some recommendations on on these projects, um, uh, Sam. To your question about ninety nine year leases, they're generally you know that's generally considered kind of standard in in legal uh, ground leases today, and and is kind of considered a, if you will, a, a, a almost a permanent disposition of the land. So. Uh, we will all not be here in 99 years, but at some point the town and Wayfinders will have to revisit that many decades from now. Uh, thank you. Uh, Sean, do you have a quick comment? We're yeah, really it's, a, it's actually just a very quick question for Diane. Um, and I apologize if you said this, the, uh, if the town was to, or if the committee was to recommend the town approve this request, when would the Wayfinders actually need the money? And I ask that because we have a couple projects that we're paying off now that are coming off the books um, in two or three years. And I know sometimes these projects, the money isn't actually needed for a couple of years down the road. So I'm just curious the timing of when you'd actually need the funds from the town. We, the, the way we were hoping to use those funds is for that early stage due diligence. So that would also mean that we wouldn't necessarily have to take out a pre-development loan, which would add cost because of interest. Um, so the sooner the better. We're working with the, you know, with the architects now. We're starting some of that work, and if we could use that that money now, that would be great. If so, you know if we have to delay, we will we'll try to figure a way to build our, you know, build in that additional time if we need to wait until funds are available. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sean and Diane. I, I have one last question. Uh, it, it was asked to you in writing, which would would and could any preference be considered or granted? to existing longer term Amherst residents. Uh, the response was no local preference at this time. Uh, while many municipalities may require local preference, uh, it can be counter to the goals of fair housing. Um, is that, I guess the question is, what was the reason uh, for the decision to not consider local preference at this time? Is that a wayfinders uh, determination? Or is that a mandate from some form of uh, regulation related to the housing? Does that make sense, what I'm asking? Yes, it does. And, and so, you know, who made, the, running, who made the call is the question, I guess. Uh, we're running into issues right now with another one that has a local preference. And it, it really isn't up to us. In it, it, it's it's going to be, it's structured in the same way this one sort of is, and it actually has to go to HUD, and HUD actually approves it. The you know, Zoning Board of Appeals could put it as a condition for a local preference, but in the end, it's really going to be up to HUD if, if they'll allow it. Okay, I believe I understand what you're saying there. Um, I like to remind the committee members that any additional questions, there'll be an opportunity to send them in writing. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for uh, your clarity of presentation and your dexterity with fielding questions. <laughs> uh, 
and it's been informative to me and others. And I'd like to uh, thank you for your uh, application and presentation and time. Thank you for thank the you. time and the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, so. So uh, we've run a little bit late, but we have a fourth presentation, uh, which is the rental subsidy program phase two. Uh, and uh, the applicant uh, individual on the application is Wei Ling Greeny, who we have spoken with in the past. Uh, I don't see her name in the audience, but I do see Amherst Community Connections. Um, Sonia, can you bring in Amherst Community Connections. Right now, uh, your microphone's on mute. It's unmuted at present. Uh, can you hear us? Uh, yes. I assume Wei Ling. Hello, Wei Ling. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. I'm and the, the floor is you. yours. Uh, I don't see that we have a um, presentation scheduled after you. And thank you for patiently waiting while the other uh, presentations and questions occurred. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, this is our second time asking for funding for this uh, rental subsidy program. And uh, because the phase one went so successfully and the statistics that we collected based on the 17 families, and 100% of them, after they graduated from our program, they remain housed. No family became homeless. So that's a big thing, because when one becomes homeless, it takes so much more effort to get them out of that spiraling downward conditions. And the reason that we are able to do it is because that incentive of $400 a household a month who toured their family and it's not a blank check. They have to show us that they work hard and they work toward that $400. So what do they have to do in order to show us that they work hard? Number one, they have to show that they have paid their rent for a month when they are in the program. So the rent receipt is what we look for. So for example, if you wanna come and get $400 for November this month, you gotta bring your rental receipt for November. That's the first condition. And the second condition is that you have to come attend weekly meeting, case manager meeting, there's no substitute. It's the support service to help you hold on to your jobs, to help you apply to the many, many benefit programs that you are entitled to, such as food stamp, such as other subsidized housing, such as fuel assistance, such as the uh, discounted utility, such as a discounted uh, internet service. All those things I think I described to you, the value of those 10 different programs, we estimated it's between $27,000 and $42,000. So by us working with them month after month, we are helping their family accessing those public benefits program in that quantity that I described. So case management is the key to stabilizing these families housing. And that $400, once they get it, they pay other expenses, whether it's medication they need, whether it's extra serving or green vegetables on the table, they spend it, they see fit, but there are conditions. So at the end of the day, the 17 families, half of them, half of them are families. We support them on the average of 15 months. And the other half is individuals, no children in the family. So the average cost per applicant on the program is about $6,000 for families. And for individuals, it's $3,000. Now I want to give you a number to compare. When family are behind on rent, they could get up to $18,000 during the pandemic of raft money in order to pay their back rent. But that money from raft, no string attached. And oftentimes people, they go back to owe rent, rent landlord money. And in our program, 
They don't do that. They use the money they get to pay expenses, but they have to save the money to pay their rent first. So because of that very successful program and the fact everybody stay housed and 100% of them were working, they work hard in, in order to make their rent payment. So we have the ambition. I really appreciate that the committee is working hard to get affordable housing to be built. And I'm just so heartened to hear that Wayfinders is hoping to build 71 units at the price tag of $1.8 million application hoping to get from the town. That's very excellent. But the families today, when they are paying rent month after month, they cannot wait until the 71 units are built for them to get into. Now they are paying between 50% to 90% of their income to a rent. That's our statistics. So to wrap this up, actually this program by you giving us the money to pay for the subsidy, it's basically money you give to us, we hand it to them. But we have to go after another huge grant, which is CDBG to provide the support service. And without the support service, the rental subsidy simply doesn't work. Money, it's a for short term solution. But if you money plus support service, that's a long term solution. So the experience we have had based on the phase one, we want to ask for money to support 12 families instead of six families. And the consideration has to do with the fact we have to hire caseworkers to do management of these 12 households and the job market is tight. I cannot hire caseworkers if I only give them half time position. So in order to make it work, I have to go raise funds to hire a full time worker to provide the service. So economy of scale really dictates me to request for 12 families. But besides that, there are so many families in Amherst. This is a program just for Amity, for families in Amherst. Doesn't benefit any other towns at all. It's families here in Amherst you are supporting. So we have four immigrant families. They are in the 17 you know, household. One of them is trying to buy a house today. And the reason they could do it is both parents work hard as custodians and they have three beautiful boys and they came here four years ago, look at their hard work in our case management support and the $400 a month for 15 months. Today, the family is thriving and they are looking to buy a house in Amherst. So with the questions you might have after I submitted our uh, response to your uh, eight questions, I welcome additional questions that you might have for me. Thank you very much, Waylon. Uh, uh, it's always uh, good to hear from you and your clarity uh, and uh, passion related to your presentation. <laughs> that, that Same. How do you uh, say your last name? I'm sitting here thinking McLoy. Uh, well, it, it's pronounced many different ways by different people, <laughs> uh, but it, it's properly pronounced McLeod. McLeod. Yes. Well, uh, we have a board member, his last name. Spell a little bit differently, but it's McLeod. Thank yes. you. Uh, thank you. There's a, a few of us in different places. Um, I'd like to open the uh, floor to committee members to ask questions. I see one hand raised. Uh, Matt, uh, if you'd like to ask your question, Waylon. Yeah. Hi, Waylon. Um, I understand the case management model, uh, and I think that's great that you can um, move people from being in a situation where they're not managing to where they are managing. Uh, my sort of question is if it's if it's worth if it's worth so much to people to be able to access all of those other funding sources, why do we also need to provide them four hundred dollars a month? And then secondly, um, why couldn't we just provide them four hundred dollars the first month and like taper that off over the fifteen month period? Well, to answer the question you have, Mr. Kane, 
those programs that you have to apply and our general population we, that we are working with, they are low income with limited technology access, lack of computer, lack of internet connection, and lack know-how. The online application means a, a I, I understand that they yeah. need your help to do it, but um, once you explain to them the value that's out there, why don't they just come to you for that? They come to us to apply to these programs. We help them. But month after month, they have different programs. They have different problems happen. It's not just after you apply to these 10 programs, you are done. So they have different, you know, uh, challenges. For example, during the pandemic, we have families. They have no money to pay their rent. So they cannot get the money we provide. And yet, we help them access RAFT program. And that's something happened during the pandemic. We have money sitting there, up to 18000 you can apply. But we cannot anticipate what month they are going to be falling behind on their rent. So the continued help for those months to help them deal with life challenges, to help them grow strong, it's a wise investment. It's not a one-time deal. Think about yourself. In your life, maybe, you know, you are doing well. I'm not a good example. Um, <laughs> so uh, I guess the problem is that um, I'm just trying to stretch the money as far as possible. Mm -hmm. And the second question, I'm sorry, I didn't hear your second question. Like if, if you could start at $400 a month I'll and then taper, taper off. that off, that would only require half the amount of funding and yeah. might be able to achieve the same result. Yeah. Um, you know, they are paying so much of their income to a rent. Between 50 to 90% of their funds for rent. So just that $400 stress is a killer, kills you. So okay, but, but you're saying you're saying that after 15 months, the families are graduating, so they're no longer needing. That's it. our average. That's our average. Yeah. Well, individuals, because you are only one person. So it takes shorter period of time, eight months. We can get you to find a job. We can get you to find two jobs. We can help you go back to school for training. But for family, they have children. So both parents, or oftentimes it's a single parent household. The mother has to work hard. And we have to help them secure a babysitter or find, find funding for childcare. And it takes longer to help family to get through and be able to come out the other side. Thank you, Raylan. I see uh, Robin has her hand up. Robin? Yeah, I just wanted to make a quick uh, comment about um, how challenging those um, social services programs can be to access and knowing that they um, are not all, uh, th that they're, um, they're awarded at different income levels. There's no, there's not, a, there's not consistency year to year with benefits. Um, it's not quite as simple as you apply to everything and, and you're, you're getting $25,000 a year. So I just wanted to make that, um, that comment. Uh, thank you, Robin. Uh, I have a question for you, Wei-Ling. I see that in the um, questions, you indicated that the target population for the subsidy program are families and individuals. Although this evening, I'm hearing you talk about families. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, of the 12 targeted groups, is, is it in fact that you're targeting only families at this time? Or might no. there be some individuals as well? And uh, how does that typically break out in terms of how many uh, in the past? I mean, realize there's a limited sample size. Yeah, well, in the past, we had 17 families uh, in the program, of which nine are families and eight are individuals, okay. households. Okay. But in terms of the screening process, we target families, individuals living in Amherst, and they have to be rent burden, paying more than 50% of their income to rent. And then the third criteria is that they have to be at some point at risk of becoming homeless due to rent owed to the landlord. So by the time they come to us, they're already in deep trouble and we have to help them get back. 
I have a follow-up question. Uh, I don't see other hands up, so I'll ask it. Um, have you, do you have any experience or awareness as to what has happened to those in the past who were not accepted into the program, even though they uh, met your criteria? That is to say, uh, I assume you have uh, challenging decisions to make uh, when applicants, uh, when you have more applicants than you have slots. Uh, what type of uh, outcomes have you seen, if you're even aware, for those who have applied but not been accepted? Okay. Um, Mr. McCloy, maybe I can give you a more general understanding because we do not follow those 24 families, but by and large, our agency serves over 600 households a year, and almost 100% of them, they are either extreme low income or have no income. And about half of them, they are people of color. And also, by and large, about half of them experience homelessness or they are at risk of becoming homeless. So the reason people become homeless, many reasons, but realizing that you had to pay rent in order to have a roof over your head, you might have mental health issues, substance, substance use disorder you are experiencing, but if you don't have money, you don't have housing. It's that simple. So to answer your question in this come a little way, what happened to them? I can only, based on our experience working with the families, you know, 99% of them who are not in this program, they 50% of the times they experience homelessness or a risk of facing eviction. So I, yeah, can tell you that's the picture of the families or individuals we cannot help. But I can also share with you families who are in the program, by and large, they all look is so much better. Thank you for answering that. I have a follow up if anyone else raises a hand, I'd be glad to call on you. Um, in your, your target population, you have under A, meaning first, Renton Amherst. Um, I believe a few years ago, uh, I asked the question, I'll ask it again. Um, is the time period that someone has been in Amherst uh, is there a minimum time period that somebody should have been renting in Amherst to be eligible for the program of Amherst CPA funds? Ah, you know, people don't move to Amherst to get to this program, get $400 a month, <laughs> they don't. They are already in Amherst and they're having such a hard time. Okay. So who are these people who will help? They work at the local cafe, coffee shops, Black Sheep, The Works, Brugger's, Ritz, Fire Farm, all these places that they work in Amherst or UMass Dining Common, for example. So we don't ask, why are you moved to Amherst? Is it because we have wonderful Amherst Community Connections, $400 a month for you? No, they are already in Amherst and they got in trouble because of various financial struggles. So we reach out to them, but I can assure you, no one ever say they moved to Amherst because we have this stuff. Uh, subsidy for them. Okay. The chance of getting it is so small. We have 20, today we have 28 families and individuals waiting. The time when I wrote to you, it was 24 families. That was six weeks ago. In the past six weeks, we have added four more households on the waiting list. Yeah. Well, thank you for uh, uh, clarifying or uh, opening the window to, in response to my question. Um, I just have a comment. I, I don't know what the committee will decide in our challenging environment uh, this year with our funding, but I do have to say that I find you inspiring in your uh, presentation and that the, what I hear of the, the, the emote, you emote dedication. Uh, I can only imagine how uh, challenging uh, the endeavor is that you're involved in. And I do see the, uh, uh, just, it, it makes common sense to me, the value associated with all the wraparound services for those who are challenging. So 
Um, thank you for what you do. It means a lot to me. Sam, it means so much to me to hear that you can sense my enthusiasm. But my secret is I have a team of dedicated young people. Every year, we attract between 20 to 30 college interns. Each one of them work 12 hours a week for the entire year. And they inspire me. They care. So 20 to 30. So this semester right now, we have 13 interns. And each one of them give back to the community. So I'm inspired by them. So I will share with them of your sentiment. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Tim. Yeah, sorry. I thought of one quick question. Um, I was the last year was my first year in the committee and I don't you mentioned this was your quote second time around. Does that mean this is the second request for funding and you received a request previously or were you denied previously I don't know what the history is. This is phase two. So when I refer to the second time around three years ago, we got funded for a rental subsidy program phase okay. one and All because right. it's so successful helping so many families, and yet there are so many of them, families, individuals are on the wait list. So we became bold, ambitious. We want to help more. Okay. So we wrote the grant for phase two. And I love one of your questions. You say, one of the questions, do you anticipate this program will be phase three, phase four, phase five? And I think I say to you, well, housing is always a basic human needs. So long we have problem with affordable housing, I'm afraid we might continue to have the need to help families, individuals with their financial struggles. And I wish that we have the, all the affordable housing for those who need it so that we will go out of business. I'm 65, I'm happy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michelle. Yeah, just real quick. Um, thank you. Um, the other presentations we heard of from today uh, have a target community like that's BIPOC. And you mentioned 50% of your family is where is that pretty consistent throughout the years of the program or um, it's not necessarily, a, it sounds like socioeconomic is more the community that you serve, but um, is that, yeah, is that a pretty consistent um, community for you? Well, if you allow me to tell you, 71% of the families and individuals receive funding, they are from the BIPOC community. And considering in Amherst, we only have about 30%. So people who need help, need support. Unfortunately, the majority are people of color, BIPOC community. They tend to be less endowed with wealth or employment, you know, uh, higher wages. No, they are mostly low income working people, low wage earners. And that's really the sad story. If you're people of color because of various back institutional racism or whatnot, you tend not to get good jobs. You tend to be lower in, on the lower wage spectrum. And so what can we do to help everybody have equal access to the basics of life? The social service program is really an equalizer. So that's why I'm just so excited to see with all the talk criticizing racism in the society, let's take what we have and apply it, get everybody up where we are you know, trying to address the structural racism. So this is a very concrete way to really address the social ills. Um, are there any further questions at this time from our committee members or those in attendance? I don't see any. Uh, Huilin, I'd like to thank you for your time and presentation. Uh, and I'd like to remind committee members again, as I have with others, that if questions arise that we can send them uh, to Wailing uh, Thank you. at a later time. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Appreciate your service to the town and to the residents of Amherst. I know right. evening is usually you want to go home and 
watch your Netflix during your dinner. But today you are here letting me share with you my enthusiasm. And I used to serve on the select board. I'm so happy we have you serving the town of Amherst. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, so we've run over, but uh, luckily we have uh, uh, been able to have all the uh, presentations completed. We uh, had a little bit of extra time on this last one. Um, our next agenda item uh, is review of financials. Uh, Sonia, are you prepared to do so? Um, sure. Did you want to see if there you was any, question, any questions in the audience? Uh, Oops. I don't see any. We did have a um, previous, comments. Uh, public comment previously. I see four attendees. Does anyone have any uh, question or comment from the audience members, the community attendees? If you have, please raise your hand. I'm not seeing any, so uh, I think we're we're all set there. Um, so we can move on and uh, review financials if you can provide an update uh, sure. on you, if that makes sense from where we were in the summer and if there's been any more clarity or not in terms of where we are. Thank you. Can you see that on the screen? No. No? Not, yes. If, if anyone can't see it, please raise your hand. I think we're we're okay, Sonia. Okay. Um, so Although, for the... actually, could you enlarge it? Um, that is to say, shrink the area of focus so the font will appear larger on screen. Uh, I can I'll see do my it, best, but I, but I can't read it. <laughs> I'll do you my see best. the colors and the. Uh, that's a bit better for me, anyway. Uh, can other members see this? Okay, they seem to be able to see it. So, okay. So for um, for those new members on on the committee um, this time, I just want to explain that our CPA budget is based on estimates, just like our operating budget. So there's a bit of guesswork that goes along with this each year. Um, our actual balance that we ended as of June thirtieth of 2022 was 2.3 million. And this, the first box up here, it's fiscal year 23. So we have to kind of follow through fiscal year 23 to get to where we're at for fiscal year 24, which is what's available. So we ended with 2.3 million and we, we estimate what we're gonna take in for surcharges. We had an estimate of a million coming in for surcharges. And that's a very conservative estimate. We try to keep these conservative. State match, we have an estimate of 3.5, I mean, 350,000 for an available FY23 budget of 3.66. We had appropriations in 23 of 2.346. And then we, we budgeted a reserve of 533,000. That, gives us an estimated amount that we will end with of June 30th of fiscal year 23. That will get carried over to be our beginning balance for fiscal year 24. And again, that's an estimate. So once we close the books, it, it could be more. We, we are estimating a 1.1 million uh, surcharge. And then state match, we estimate at 25% at 275, which gives us the 2.1 million. We have our debt service, which we're obligated to pay at 443, 460, which leaves us a balance of 1.7 available for fiscal year 24. But I wanna point out that we budgeted a reserve of 533,000 for fiscal year 23. If the committee chooses to release that budgeted reserve and use it towards the fiscal year 24 proposals, we can do that. So that would add another 533,000 to that. And we have to budget a reserve because once we, we can only use estimated receipts until we, we set a tax rate. Once our tax rate is set, then we can't use estimated receipts again. We can't come back later on and say, oh, a project came up and 
um, we might get a little more money. So we estimate a little more money and appropriate from that. We can't do that. The only way we could uh, appropriate anything is on borrowing, unless we have this reserve in place that we can appropriate from. So did I confuse any, everybody? <laughs> so at this point, we have 1.7 million. But if we use that 533, that will get added. Also, I want to point out that way up here, the estimate for state match is at 350 right now. We should be receiving our actual state match, and it's based on the fiscal year 20, fiscal year 22 surcharge, what we collected. They base that's what they base the percentage, um, the amount they pay us. Right now, we're expecting 22. 22.35%, but we just got news that that might be higher. So we should be receiving that before by the end of November. So that might increase our balance a little too. So this is going to evolve through the time that we're going through this process. So there'll be an update, periodic updates on this. Did I totally uh, confuse a, everybody? I, I understand it. Uh, I, I have a question for you, Sonia. Um, my understanding is that we have a, a challenging um, funding time period in fiscal 24 and perhaps fiscal 25. Uh, do you happen to know what our debt service might be in future, uh, as in 2025, approximately? I'm asking I'm that uh, in the context of uh, when the time comes for us to consider um, the reserve. Here's our fiscal year 24 total right here. In 25, um, I believe it's a Jones Library collections room that might come into play in the high school track. Is this, can this be enlarged at all? Is there a way to zoom in or perhaps shrink in? Did that enlarge it? That's helping. Whatever you just did is making it easier. Yes. Not very computer savvy. Uh, that's exactly, that was quite uh, useful. So 443, 460 for fiscal year 24. And right. if, I, if I read it correctly, it's 543, 250 in uh, fiscal, next year, fiscal year 25, mm -hmm. 450 the following year. So um, but these these two down here, um, the projects haven't started yet, so that might even get pushed out further. So at this point, we're anticipating that we're going to have to pay debt service for them in fiscal year 25. And Sam, this is Sean, the um, the track and field project. We still don't know for sure whether the, whether the larger turf uh, track reorientation project is going to go through. So um, it's on here now to be conservative, but we'll have a better idea in January whether that project is moving forward or not. And it, it, if I'm correct, is that dependent upon the uh, regional towns uh, as well as the boosters? Is that the determining? Um, Amer still has to approve its final share. So it's been brought to the council, um, a final um, request. I think it was about $800,000. Um, and the council wanted to wait to act on it until they got some more information. So the town, the council still has to appropriate their last piece of the funding. The other, sorry for my child, uh, the other towns have to appropriate their portions and then there's fundraising that was, would have to happen. Um, but the trigger is on, I think, January 13th, um, there's a certain amount that has to be raised. And if Amherst doesn't come up with its portion, it's unlikely that will be raised. Okay. Uh, Andy, I see your hand is up. Yeah, thanks, Sam. I love, by the way, not only does Sonia know the answer, she has an arrow pointing to <laughs> answer the question. She anticipated it that well. Um, yeah, so my my question, similar, uh, also related to your portions, uh, is, um, is there any sort of fiscal guidance that you might offer in terms of what the ratio should be of those portions to the actual um, you know, the, the money we receive on an annual basis. And then maybe that could be like too loaded of a question. Are you, do you know other communities, how they manage this? Um, is it a, is it a similar type of ratio? 
Um, I guess the long story short is any concerns if we take on larger projects that we need debt service for. Is Sean still on? Yeah. Um, so we can certainly look into what other communities are doing. I think you know Sonia and I did talk about this. The debt is pretty high right now. Um, with the if the Jones Library project moves forward and the track and field project moves forward, um, for at least the next couple of years, you can see it gets up to over five hundred thousand. We do have a couple large ones that will be paid off at that time, so there there could be capacity to take on more debt later on, which is why I asked that question of um, wayfinders about when they when the funding would be required because we do have a little bit of a drop off in FY twenty six. And, and so, but we can look into what other towns do, but it's really, it's up to the committee, sort of what you feel comfortable with, you know, the more debt you have, the less projects, you, new projects you can approve each year. So, um, you know, we sort of look to the past to see where you've been, we're a little bit higher than where we've been historically, um, but it was for some, you know, worthwhile projects. So it's really a conversation for the committee to have every year, but Sonia and I are a little bit worried that the, not worried, but we, we do think the debt is sort of at a higher point right now and you should be, um, you know, consider that as you approve any more borrowings. Thanks. Michelle, your hand is up, although you're muted. Yeah, sorry. Um, sorry if this is in the table. I can't really see the whole thing, but I'm just curious for the um, reserve release, if you said that's a possibility for perhaps releasing more funding and what proportion of that has been released typically in years past, or if there is a typical proportion released? Proportion of, are you talking about this sheet or the back to the budget sheet? The, uh, so the reserves that we set aside, Sonia, the reserve um, fund. It's like fund. half a million. So that's Previous sort of a, sheet. so Sonia, can you explain how, why the reserve fund got set up? Um, Cause I think it's, it's a little bit newer, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, once we set the tax rate, we can't use estimated receipts anymore. And the DOR requires that you, you have to have a funding source. You can't appropriate unless you have a funding source. So once you set the tax rate, it, even if there was money left over in the CPA fund, you couldn't access that unless you, unless you appropriate it as a budgeted reserve. So it's kind of like a free cash. It kind of works the same way as free cash does for the um, operating budget. And it actually closes out as of June 30th. And it, what I mean by close out, it doesn't leave CPA. It just goes back to the unappropriated fund balance to be appropriated again. But if we don't, it's up to the committee whether they want to let that go for fiscal year 23 in case another project comes up or not, or save it for another project. If the committee decides that, you know, they have a lot of good projects that they want to fund this year, then we could just release that and it would become part of the available balance for fiscal year 24. Get my fiscal years wrong here. So Does you said it, you more? Well, well, I'm just curious what, um, how it's been used in the past. Like if a proportion is generally used, you said it's new. So maybe there is no standard or. Well, we've had projects come up in the past um, for small amounts that really wasn't worth borrowing for. And it was a good, it was a good cause, but we couldn't, we couldn't uh, recommend it because the funding wasn't available. So this would make the funding available. So that's why we're doing this now. So this was set up in response to that happening. Um, I'm not sure if it's, but it's only been a few years, right, Sonia, since this has been put in place for- um, We've done it, we've done it periodically. Okay. Before that. But the, but the bottom line is if you do decide to re release it, then the, you really can't consider in any other projects after this process for the rest of the year, unless those projects are a borrowing. No projects for fiscal year 23, yes. Uh, Robin? Yeah, I was just going to um, ask if I have this right. So it's essentially a fund that allows us to have to be able to draw on cash funds off cycle. Yes, right? yes. Okay. Which we've done on a couple of occasions yeah. uh, during our time, Robin. Uh, 
Anything further to add to Sonia's uh, comments, uh, Sean? Oh, I see a question, excuse me, Tim. No, I, I was just, uh, in sum then, we have about a little more than um, 8 million of requests. And if you add the debt in, it's around roughly 2 million to appropriate or expect. So that's gonna be a challenge for us. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're, it's pretty clear we're going to have our uh, uh, task, a uh, uh, difficult task ahead of us as a committee here, uh, given the magnitude of what's out there. Uh, we've had our processes that we've used in previous years, uh, primarily trying to determine if. Uh, projects are worthy or not, uh, but we have an added dilemma this year, which is something that hasn't occurred during my time period, a little bit last year, uh, which is it's not a question necessarily of projects being worthy, but also what the budgets are going to be. Uh, so uh, I would just say to the committee members as we go forward, we're you know, I don't know how our deliberative process will, uh, the time frame that'll play out on it, but we should all, as we look at the different projects, be considering them uh, for their their merit, but also for their request. And uh, we're going to have our hands full and we'll have to collectively uh, come to some determinations. And you know, I, I may think a bit further about how we approach that. We've in the past had some, uh, uh, Andy put together a nice spreadsheet uh, that was very helpful in terms of looking at the um, the projects in terms of how they met the needs. Uh, he took the requirements, forgive me for paraphrasing Andy. Uh, we took, you took the requirements from the various um, uh, requirements that need to be met and the goals for the different categories and along with the money in one lump sum, uh, one spreadsheet, which was very helpful for gathering thoughts. And we've also had other uh, forms. Robin had one that uh, she used, and I believe it was introduced by you and Sarah Eisinger uh, in terms of how to look at it. But my, my comment at this point is that just all committee members will need to consider uh, multiple levels on these projects, the, the merits associated with them, what the funding is. And um, we may in a later meeting display some of the methods that we've used in terms of our own internal um, decision-making in terms of prioritizing projects. Uh, but no matter what individuals do, they'll have to uh, uh, consider the, the, the situation. Uh, Dave, go ahead. I saw your hand up with yeah, thanks. other attraction. Thanks, Sam. I know you're trying to wrap up probably for the evening here, but as 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 we do, I just wanted to reiterate, you know, kind of my offer that that, you know, I think Sean, Sonia, and I working with our staff can certainly, I'm thinking particularly around the affordable housing projects. I think there's certainly some work to be done that we can do um, with our staff, with the housing trust. I want to remind the committee that, you know, Carol referenced, you know, that the trust is currently, their current balance is around $600,000. I think it's important to remind all of us that those dollars are CPA dollars. They, they were allocated from, from this committee to the trust for affordable housing projects. And I want to also put it out there that the town, I believe, has um, about $500,000 that were, was allocated last year. So that's $1.1 million that are available for the projects we have before us, potentially avoid, uh, available for the projects we have before us, Valley CDC and, and Wayfinders. So I think Sean, Sonia and I can do some work. And really, uh, you know, the trust is an extension of the town. It's part of the town. So we're all on the same team when it comes to affordable housing, working for those goals. Um, I also just wanted to put out there that, you know, I think it perhaps goes without saying, but I'll, I'll put it out there that I think CPAC can ask every applicant a couple of questions, you know, that, you know, moving forward. But 
you know, ask a, each applicant, can the project move ahead with less than what has been requested? Um, I think you've been successful at doing that in the past. And I think every applicant should, should be posed that question. And is the, is the project, is it necessary for the project to go forward this year? I think you, we asked Wayfinders that, and we got the answer, you know, you all were looking for it with definitively, but I think every applicant should be asked, you know, um, can they take less than the request that they presented? And does this request have to happen this year or can it be put, put forth again next year or the year after? That's just the reality of $8 million in asks and only, you know, 1.8, roughly $1.8 million available. So, but I'm happy to work with Sonia and Sean on, and the Housing Trust and Wayfinders and Valley to see if we can find a, a path forward with those important projects, but pretty big asks. Um, thank you, Dave. Those are uh, some good points there. I, I brought up just, I, you know, started talking about this in, in general so that we have this in our mindset. And it's also important for us as committee members to hear all the presentations. This is the first round, which happens to be some large ones, but there are others as well. So we do need to be fair to uh, all the different applicants and hear their presentations, ask questions before we actually get to any deliberations. It just seems warranted that we factor in these types, you know, what the situation is. And uh, certainly, uh, uh, additional information uh, that you suggested, Dave, from the town in terms of what's available from the trust and what the town has in its balance would be a factor for the committee to consider as we go that route. Um, but, you know, we have two more weeks of uh, presentations, one next week and then a break for Thanksgiving. Um, we have some flexibility at the tail end. I don't know if our deliberation process when we get to it uh, will be quite as quick as be as previously. My my personal bias is that we'd be thorough, uh, that we provide uh, uh, genuine deliberation uh, for all these worthwhile uh, requests that come before us, so that we don't rush uh, our decision. We don't mandate decisions uh, when we get to that point uh, based upon. Uh, a calendar date as opposed to our deliberative process, whatever we determine we'll be doing. So um, I, I don't have any additional topics that I have not anticipated uh, 48 hours before the meeting. Uh, we've certainly been quite, uh, had a lot put before us today and we have a busy agenda, a busier agenda the following couple of weeks. So, uh, Without, unless there is something urgent from anyone, I'm going to um, call the meeting. Uh, and also, if members could contemplate whether or not they might be available next meeting to assist with minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Katie, for volunteering this time and Andy previously. It's always a chore. Uh, there are certain time periods where it's more of a chore, <laughs> depending on. Usually the deliberations might be a little bit more involved, just FYI, but uh, I don't believe there's a requirement to have a vote on the meeting since we've completed our agenda items. So uh, feel free to email me with any questions and also, uh, or NCC, uh, Sean or Sonia, if there are any questions, uh, we might take into consideration uh, how we might further ask and uh, Dave's comments are a good one uh, that we could post postulate to all um, applicants. So without further comment, I'm going to adjourn the meeting at 8.05 p.m. and we will meet again next Thursday, same time, six o'clock, uh, November 17th, uh, when we will be <coughs> receiving the next batch of proposal. So thank you all and welcome to new members. Uh, and I'll see you soon. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night.